Welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. And they're like, the Lord bless you. And then this is the, the solution. He's the solution to management and labor strife. Because when the Lord is ruling over the hearts of those who are ruling, things go well. When the godly rule, the people rejoice. And the godly can only rule in a godly way when God is on the throne of their heart. Only with Jesus. Only with you. Today, Pastor Sam will be continuing from where we last left off in the book of Ruth in this study entitled, Our Kinsman Redeemer. Everything that happens from this point on just says God is orchestrating an incredible, not just rescue mission, that's already taken place, but an incredible scenario where Ruth, like Rahab, is going to become an ancestress of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Well, Proverbs 16, 9 says, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. True for guys and gals, our heart sets our course. And so we say, Lord, I just want to walk with you today. He says, awesome. I have every step planned for you. But if my heart decides I'm taking a day off from the Lord today, did my religious thing the weekend, and now it's just my thing, well, he doesn't direct those steps. He whispers and shouts and does all he can to get our attention and say, you're going the wrong way. So you set your heart on him. Things are going to go well. Trust in the Lord, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. With all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. I jot it again. Ruth's situation is about to change dramatically, and I want to encourage some of you. And you know, I don't know, yours just may too. If you've been going through a horrific season, you need to know that every season has a beginning and end. That's why we call them seasons. If you're going through a terrific season, I don't want to bum you out, but there may be some horrific ones ahead. Nevertheless, everything comes to pass. Every season comes and goes. Chapter 2, verse 4, Behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Let me ask quickly, when was the last time you went to work and uh, the boss came out and said, the Lord be with you? And you all answered, the Lord bless you. Yeah, not that often. We don't even do that here at Calvary, and we really should. The point is, this is the solution. He is the solution to class warfare. There, there, there's not, hey, he owns the land, and here we are working the fields. There's the Lord bless you guys. And, and they're like, the Lord bless you. And then this is the, the solution. He's the solution to management and labor strife. Because when the Lord is ruling over the hearts of those who are ruling, things go well. When the godly rule, the people rejoice. And the godly can only rule in a godly way when God is on the throne of their hearts. And so anyway, at this point in chapter 2, verses 5 through 9, Boaz notices Ruth. He inquires about her. He actually engages and speaks kindly to her, makes some promises. He's like, hey, stay in my fields. I'll make sure that you're safe. There'll be provision for you. There'll be protection for you. He has to say to her, I've instructed my young men not to mess with you. And if you're wondering why would they, she's a Moabite. All the nice Jewish girls don't want to mess around. And uh, guys are guys. And so she's a Moabite. They got to think, there's no way, right? No, they don't think that, by the way. You'll see it in a moment. It's a crazy, wonderful, beautiful declaration of what everybody came to know about Ruth. But he promises protection and provision. In verse 10, she fell on her face, take note of it, bowed down to the ground, said to him, why? Have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? I love that. She's humble and she's curious. She's humble enough to, to say, I don't deserve anything. And she's curious as to why. Why are you blessing me so? 
Well, we already got the answer. He's a godly man. He, he, he's he's a, a God-fearing, God-serving, God-representing man, something we need more and more of in our generation. Verses 11 through 19, we find he's heard about her kindness to Naomi. As she says, hey, you know, why are you being so kind to me? He goes, hey, everyone knows the kind of woman you are. And, and he, he talks to her about his knowledge of her husband's death and her decision to trust the Lord, to leave her land, to leave her family, to leave her people, to leave behind the idols and to come. And then she expresses her gratitude and finds herself invited to the master's table for bread, for vinegar, for brain. It's a beautiful parallel. You can see it, of course. Why has God loved us? It's not because he saw us as so lovely or so good or no, he just loves. But then he sees us doing good and he takes note of every single thing. He invites us to his table. He wants us to feast with him, not just read about him or know of him, but be intimate with him. Well, his generosity, verse 20 through 23, along with her hard work lead to unprecedented success. It's gleaning history. She comes home with a bushel of grain. And Naomi, when she sees it, for the first time in the story, we read something seems to be going right for her. She's filled with joy. She hears it was Boaz and tells Ruth, he's a close relative and a goel, a kinsman redeemer. Very important in the story. Well, three laws in Israel are in play. First, the law of the gleaner. We've seen it. Second of the Leverite marriage, we've talked about it, but I'll remind you of it. If you married gals and uh, your husband died before you were able to conceive a child, it was his brother's responsibility then to marry you, have a child with you to carry on his brother's name, that part of the family's name. If there was no brother, then it would go to a cousin or an uncle or someone else in the family. And that's what's going on here. A widow without a child was to marry so her dead husband's name would be carried on. Now, the third part of that is that of the Goel or kinsman redeemer. And when we get to the end of all this, we'll flesh it out a little more. But let me just say he had to be able to redeem and he had to be willing to redeem. And that's just two fourths of the equation. Able and willing. We're gonna find he is certainly both. Well, Naomi, who knows and loves and respects Boaz, decides to play the part of the matchmaker. Now, that's not that strange in Israel because most marriages were agreements between the parents that, hey, my son and your daughter, and then every Passover, our families, every Feast of Tabernacles, our families, every journey to Jerusalem, we all go together. It was a family affair, not just the wedding, the life that followed it. They were uniting two families. And I think that there was some real wisdom in all of that. Well, even with the parents working on it, oftentimes there'd be a matchmaker to say, have you seen so-and-so's daughter? And they are the nicest people and she cooks a mean lamb. And so, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Anyway, it might seem strange to us in their culture, it's not strange at all. Now, she gives Ruth some instructions that seem equally challenging. And I want to assure you nothing unseemly or immoral or improper takes place as Ruth is actually going to propose to Boaz. Now, the reason for this is simple. Their parents aren't around to make the arrangements. She doesn't have hers and he certainly doesn't have his. And he's older than her. We don't know how much older, but you'll see it as we read together. He's older. And so he probably isn't thinking, hey, she'd choose me. But we're going to see where all this goes. Look at it. Chapter 3, verse 1. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, my daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? Now, Boaz, whose young woman you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he's winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Therefore, wash and anoint yourselves, put on your best garment, go down 
to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he's finished eating and drinking. Then it shall be when he lies down, you shall notice the place where he lies and you shall go in, uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what you should do. And he said to her, or excuse me, she said to her, all that you say to me, I will do. Now, it's a true story. It's not a fable. The book of Ruth doesn't begin once upon a time and end they lived happily ever after. This is the story of a real family who's experienced real suffering, real sorrow, and they've struggled. And now God is turning things around. And of course, God isn't trying to figure it out as he goes along. He's always had this in mind. So I want you to see the typology, at least in this part. I have told you, I'd mentioned just a few. This is so big. Boaz for us here, though he's a real guy and, you know, real in the story, he's a type of Christ. He is willing to redeem. He's able to redeem and he is going to redeem. Now, to redeem her means to, to actually give her a chance to fulfill what she would have sensed the call on her life to bear children and raise a family and, and to be a part of a, a, a spiritual community. Well, in any case, at this point, um, that's what's taking place. Boaz, a type of Christ. Ruth, a type of the church. Because Jesus, of course, was willing and able and wanting to redeem us, and he's done that. He calls us, his church, the bride of Christ. Naomi is doing the work of the Holy Spirit. Ordinarily, we discourage believers from doing the Holy Spirit's work because we really need to let him have his way. We preach the word. He does the work of convicting hearts and converting people to, to Christ. The word of God and the spirit of God, all we need to see hearts and lives changed for God. So, so she, though, does the work as she's sort of the matchmaker, bringing Boaz and Ruth together. So she went down, verse 6, to the threshing floor, did according to all her mother-in-law instructed her. Boaz, after he'd eaten and drunk, and his heart was cheerful. He went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came softly. Now, I was reading this with Pam yesterday, and we were talking about it. And I said, you know what? This reminds me of something. And she said, don't you say it. Because in Judges, and she was here last night. I said it, so I already, you know, already blew it. But, but uh, in Judges, there was another who came softly, was there not? Those of you who studied through it with us, yeah, JL, she came softly with her hammer in her stake, and she put it through the, the temple of Caesarea. So this isn't like that at all, but it just reminded me she came softly. Sometimes gals come softly, and that's scary. And other times they come softly, and that's all good. This is one of those times. She uncovers his feet and lays down. Now, what happened at midnight, the man was startled. Apparently, this wasn't a common occurrence. And he turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. Now, I know to you that probably doesn't sound like a proposal, but it is. What she's saying, fulfill the role, do your duty, if you will, of the kinsman redeemer. Now, he's going to say, hey, I'll do my duty, but I'm thinking he's been praying for this all along. This is far more than, yep, okay, well, it's right to do. I guess I'll do it. No, he says to her, verse 10, blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you've shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, and that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know, listen, that you are a virtuous woman, a cursed Moabite, but they knew her as virtuous, a good name, a good reputation, real character, real purity, great value in God's sight and so needed in a culture where those things are rarer and rarer. Well, verse 12, now it's true I'm a close relative. However, there's a relative closer than I. Stay this night and in the morning it shall be. If he'll perform the duty of a close relative for you, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty. See, there's that word again, the duty, the duty, the duty. 
for you as the Lord lives, lie down until morning. Again, he's willing to do his duty. I'm betting he's praying that he be the one. Well, verses 14 through 17, she rose early before dawn because they didn't want to taint her reputation in any way. Have anyone say, hey, I saw Ruth down here with Boaz last night. He filled her shawl with six large scoops of barley. She takes it to Naomi, who tells her, do not worry. She says, look at it, verse 18. She said, sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out, for the man will not rest until he's concluded the matter this day. He He's the kind of man, and she knows it, that he is not going to pass on this opportunity. He is going to get it done, and he's going to get it done swiftly. I jotted again, what's harder than waiting? Stressing out while you're waiting. And what she's telling her is, don't stress, do wait. This is all going to work out. Chapter 4, Boaz finds his competition early in the morning. He gathers 10 elders together at the gate of the city. That would make this a legal you know, binding transaction and shares the situation. There's another legal issue at play here as the deal seems at first to be about land. If you read it, it's like, why are they negotiating land? Because the land had to stay in the family. Remember the tribes were given an allotment of land, but within the allotment, every family had their own parcel of land. So your family would have an inheritance forever. That's important. It's important to them. It's important to us. And so what's taking place is he goes and he says, look, you know that Naomi's son died, that her husband died, that her sons died. And and, well, there's this field and it needs to be redeemed. And uh, I'm willing to redeem it, but you're first in line. And so if you want to redeem it, redeem it. If not, I want to redeem it. And the guy's like, all right, I want it. Land, who couldn't use that? Well, Boaz doesn't really need it, but he's interested in it, but he's interested in it because there's something precious that comes with it. He says, in the day that you buy the land from Naomi, you also buy it from Ruth because she's an heir now because her husband was a part owner of that land. And he goes, well, I can't, no, that won't work for me. What, what, this is where that kinsman redeemer, Leverite marriage thing comes in. He, he has a family, see this other heir, uh, this other relative. And, and, and so I, I, while it doesn't say it straight up, I'm pretty sure it's like, hey, I got a family. I don't think my wife's going to go for this. And that's a good thing. Let me just say, it wasn't God's will that those two be together because he already had a family. Boaz apparently does not have a wife, does not have a family. Was he a widower? We don't know. But we know there was nothing keeping him from loving Ruth and, and drawing her and blessing her and, and being with her for the rest of his life. So, The close relative, verse six, it's there, said, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself for I cannot redeem it. So he wants the land, but he can't take Ruth. Besides, he's married, so he doesn't really have any good option to have her. And so uh, I just jotted again, how happy is Boaz? Yeah, I think he's pretty happy right now. Verse 7 through 12, they seal the deal with the sandal exchange. It's another one of those weird cultural things where it's like, okay, you and I struck a land deal. I sell you my house, so take off my sandal and give it to you. Can I just say, it? both sandals makes more sense. I'm not saying the whole sandal thing is ridiculous, but I'm saying who needs one sandal? And somebody did come up last night and say, well, it was probably just proof of the transaction. Two would be twice as much proof. And so uh, anyway, they did things the way they did them. I don't have to understand them all. Just read them and enjoy them. Well, anyway, they seal the deal. Boaz declares Ruth will be his wife. The crowd has grown and witnesses abound. Some are rejoicing, some are prophesying, others are praying that Ruth would be famous in Bethlehem. She is. She's famous well beyond Bethlehem. We're reading her story now. She's, there aren't a lot of stories or books of the Bible that, that are a woman's name. We have Esther and we have Ruth and we have, that's right, Esther and Ruth. Anyway, if you find another one, you have the wrong Bible. So, uh, so anyway, they pray that Boaz household through Ruth would be great. We're going to see that goes down as well. 
Well, Boaz, verse 13, took Ruth. She became his wife. He went into her. The Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. And the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who's not left you this day without a redeemer, a close relative, a kinsman. May his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons and seven sons and has borne him. Now, Naomi took the child, verse 16, and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. And the neighbor women gave him a name saying, there's a son born to Naomi. Oh, I know it's Ruth's child, but you get it. Son, grandson, great-grandson, it's all the same to grandma and great-grandma and great-great-grandma. And it, he, he will be in the lineage of our Lord and Savior Jesus, our kinsman redeemer. Well, verses 18 through 22, they expand the genealogy. Oh, did I even read it? There's a son born to Naomi. I didn't. It's the latter part of verse 17. They came and called his name Obed. He's the father of Jesse, the father of David. Important because 1 Samuel, we will be introduced to grown David, David and Goliath, David and Bathsheba, David the good and David the bad, but David the king. And he, well, of course, in the lineage of our Lord and Savior Jesus, as was Rahab, as is Ruth, as will be Bathsheba, and as will be Mary, you know, there was a woman involved in every single generation. Only four women are named in Jesus' genealogy, and those are the four. Well, four things to consider, and we'll pray together. The Goel, the near kinsman, the kinsman redeemer, had to be related by blood. I wanted to end with this because we want to look at Jesus in it. This is one reason, not the only, but one important reason for the incarnation. In order to redeem us, Jesus had to become one of us, not just appear as a man, born as a man, as we were. And so the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It's John 1, 14. The second, not just related by blood, but able to pay. What was the price of redemption? Well, in that negotiation with Boaz, it was just money. But from the beginning, redemption for us was about a sacrificial lamb. And 1 Peter 1.18 says, Knowing you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Related by blood, able to pay. Oh, Jesus was able to pay. He was the only one able to pay. Willing to pay the price. John 10, 18, Jesus says, No one takes my life from me. I lay it down to myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Jesus, related by blood, able to pay, willing to pay, and and he must be free himself. You see, a slave couldn't buy another slave. A sinner couldn't atone for another's sinner's sins. So Jesus, the only one who was free from the curse of sin, the only one tempted in all ways yet without sin, and because a perfect man, the first Adam, sold us into sin, only a perfect man could rescue us from our sin. Not just its penalty, though that's step one, but from from its, its power to dominate our lives, and then ultimately its very presence. Well, Boaz bought land he didn't need in order to obtain a bride he loved, and Jesus did the same. Listen, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all he has and buys that field. The field Jesus tells us in that series of parables is the world. The treasure in the field you are his peculiar people. You are his prized and precious treasure. And for joy over you, he bought the world so he could have the treasure. We're glad you could join us today on this walk down the Calvary Road. The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico. You can visit our website at cctico.com or download the CC Chico app to connect with us 
and to find more from Pastor Sam. You could also listen to the Calvary Road podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We hope to hear from you, and until next time, may the Lord bless your walk down the Calvary Road. And your grace.